having the option to buy something on your mobile phone or in a store or on your TV or on your desktop, I think is absolutely critical in maintaining that brand experience throughout those channels. Hi, I'm Pierre Loic, CEO and co-founder of Tracker. You're listening to The Fast Track, the show where marketing decision makers share how they're handling today's unknowns and how they're preparing for the future. In this season of The Fast Track, we're talking to top executives to unpack the conversions of influencers and commerce. We'll be asking the hard questions so you can build a successful digital commerce strategy. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Tomé Thomas, CEO of Beekman 1802. In case you haven't heard of Beekman 1802, it is a prestige body and skincare brand that recently sold out two of its product lines at Ulta and became one of the highest performing skincare brands on TikTok. In today's episode, we'll be discussing how the skincare brand navigates its various commerce channels, such as the home shopping network, Alta, and its own direct-to-consumer site. I'm excited to welcome Tomei today and have him share his secret sauce to Beekman's omnichannel strategy. We'll also investigate if his company's success on TikTok is a function of smart marketing or if it is rooted in something deeper. Tomei, welcome to the Fast Track. Before we dive in and go into the, the meat of things on, uh, on social commerce and, and influencer marketing, I'd love for you to be able to give us the, the brand story. So how did the Beekman 1802 come about? Uh, how did you make it what it is today? Sure. I mean, first off, thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, Beekman 1802, we believe there is beauty and kindness. The brand uh, started in 2008, really out of necessity, when Brent and Josh, our co-founders, lost their jobs in New York City and had this uh, second farm, second mortgage in upstate New York. And they needed a way to uh, make the property pay for itself. They needed to sort of pull themselves uh, up from their bootstraps. And on the property was 80 goats at the time. It's, it was a farm, a dairy farm. And they literally Googled, what can we make with goat milk? And the first thing that came up was goat milk soap. And, uh, you know, really goat milk has, has been this almost like a folklore status in the beauty industry where... You can go into any major retailer or even farmer's market in the world and find goat milk beauty products, at least goat milk soap, but there was never really a brand that had consolidated and premiumized the industry. And that was the opportunity uh, that Brent and Josh saw. So with the help of their neighbors, they began making goat milk soap quite literally on their dining room table. And word of mouth uh, spread from there. You know, one neighbor gifted the soap to another neighbor and it changed people's skin, especially people with sensitive skin. So to fast forward a little bit, uh, you know, the company has been around for the last 12 years and has grown almost exclusively through word of mouth marketing because we say we don't just change people's skin, but we change people's lives, especially with people that have sensitive skin uh, using the power of goat milk. This is such a, a, an amazing starter story. This is very cool. And what's even more amazing is that if you fast forward to today, the, you look at the success that you guys have had uh, over the past you know, year, couple of years. And uh, as of lately, if I'm not mistaken, you sold out a couple of uh, new products on, the, on Ulta, ranking number one and two in, uh, in sales. So amazing kudos to, to having gone all that way to today's performance. Now, just between the two of us, and nobody's listening, what's the secret sauce? What, what got you to, to experience this success lately? Well, I, I think, you know, for us, it, it comes down to, to probably two or, or three things. The, the first is that our brand, as I mentioned earlier, is centered around kindness. We believe in being kind to your skin, uh, kind to animals. We're always cruelty-free, kind to the planet. So moving towards a more sustainable future, as well as kind to our community, whether that's our local, uh, you know, physical community of upstate New York, or our digital community on social and digital. 
that to us is is the center and core of the brand. The second thing, which I think is is absolutely table stakes, is the product that we create and you know sell, whether it be at QVC or Ulta, our website, or our, even in our store in upstate New York, that product has to be quality. It has to work. It has to you know make your life uh, better in some form uh, or way. And especially if you have sensitive skin, we want to be the solution because we say sensitive skin is complicated enough and we need to be able to provide you uh, comfort in our skincare and body care products. T- to me, those two things are, are absolutely paramount. The, the third thing I would say is we work with great people and great partners, whether that's our retail partners uh, or our team Beekman, the, the, the team that we've built in, uh, in the United States, or even our partners like Tracker, who've been able to help us you know, scale the business in uh, vis-a-vis TikTok. Awesome. Let, let me, to, to me, let me just ch- challenge you a bit on this, because I think all the things that you just mentioned are probably true to Beekman almost from the onset. And, and sure, progressively, things have improved. But what happened over the past 12 months that really got you to get this lift up that was very visible in the market? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I say it, uh, it's taken us 12 years to become an overnight success. You know, it's, it's not something that I think was easy or, you know, I can point to one thing. It, in my view, is a culmination of the community we've built, of the retail partnerships we built, and a testament to the brand. I think the brand has, you know, in some ways maybe reached a tipping point of sorts where, um, again, we've depended largely over the years on word of mouth. And so I think, you know, having reached a, a sense of scale where millions of people have tried the product and have experienced the benefits of goat milk, to me, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, how things have gone. But, you know, growth for us has really been tremendous over the last five years. And again, I, I, I can't really point to, to one or two things to say, you know, this was absolutely it. I think, you know, we've been trying to fire on, on all cylinders for quite some time. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, I, I completely see how the market dynamics would actually come at play. And at some point you reach that, that tipping point. It also takes a team to recognize that's where you are so that you keep pedaling. So congratulations again on, on this success. If we, if we go back to the past 18 months or so, so from the beginning of COVID, you, you know the adage that goes, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. How would you say uh, the, the last 18 months have, have morphed or changed the business in a way that is structural? Like we, we all experience things during the, the, the last 18 months from the kids at home to like a whole bunch of things, socially, professionally, et cetera. But how would you say that changed the business in a way that five years from now, you'll be able to look back and say, yeah, this, this, was, this was at that time that we started X or that we stopped Y? Sure. So I think for, for us, you know, as a brand, especially a brand that talks about kindness and has kindness at its core and kindness in everything that we do, you know, for us, 2020 was uh, a moment where this mission of ours came into the forefront. We knew that more than ever, the anxiety was high, people were afraid. You know, there was so much going on even beyond COVID last year that kindness was really important. And I think people came, whether, I, you know, regardless if, if you were an existing neighbor, we call all of our customers neighbors. If you were an existing neighbor, you knew to come to Beekman to find that, you know, retreat or, or reprieve to kindness. If you were a new customer, I think, you know, you saw a brand that really had a mission and purpose that was meaningful at a time when everyone needed a little bit of kindness in their life. So, you know, it's, it's again, much of what we were doing in terms of the brand and the ethos of the brand. I think from a, you know, business standpoint, certainly digital accelerated and beyond just digital, you know, social, uh, a lot of time was, was being spent at home and on social and on, you know, watching TV and, and, you know, shopping online. And so we've been preparing for this moment, I think for a very long time, we've made a lot of investments, not only in our team, but also within the infrastructure and, and, specifically the digital infrastructure 
uh, all the way from front end to the to the back end fulfillment in our digital business. So I think you know for a large piece of of you know not putting a crisis to waste is we were ready. We had the the things in place uh, to take advantage and maximize the environment that we were in. And, and I think, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more, we are a video brand. We, you know, have always resonated more on video than in any other format. And so when TikTok came to rise during the pandemic, you know, we were, we were ready to go and, and we wanted to uh, really be a first mover on the platform. And of course, you know, Tracker has been um, really uh, instrumental in our success there. That's awesome. Thanks for for sharing. Uh, as you're you're mentioning TikTok, I, I can't help but uh, draw a parallel between your brand values and what the market saw in TikTok. That, in my view, in part to explain the rise of TikTok in in a moment where everything was gloomy, just finding a seed of positivity and entertainment that was uplifting, and it feels like you guys just sort of fit right in into that trend. So I, I can see how your brand values and what TikTok was bringing to the world around that time also helped the, the success of, uh, of bo- both partners. Are there things specific when, when you look at uh, uh, TikTok and the, the amazing success that you guys have had there, are there specifics that you could point to for your fellow entrepreneurs that they should look at, say, wh- what, what works and what doesn't when it comes to success on TikTok? Sure. So let's start with with what doesn't work. Maybe that's the easier answer. What doesn't work on TikTok is what I think is a problem in the beauty industry as in general, which is highly stylized, high production, and sometimes high cost content. You're just never going to be able to produce, you know, unless you're, you know, a, a massive multinational. Uh, company, but I, I think even then you, you probably can't afford it, you're never going to be able to produce the type of content and the amount of content required for TikTok in a highly stylized, high production format. It, it, you know, TikTok requires a minimum of three pieces of content a day. They have to you know, be highly relevant each day. What is relevant is changing. So if you need a studio, if you need, you know, uh, pages and pages of storyboards and scripts and an agency, I I don't think you're going to turn the amount of content in a relevant way uh, that's required for TikTok. So what does that mean, right? Like that means that we have to, you know, everyone's been talking about UGC, but I, I don't even think UGC outside of, you know, your own team is relevant for TikTok anymore. I think you need to have a team internally that is able and capable of spitting out three to five pieces of content every other day. And I think it has to be raw. I think it has to be engaging, compelling, relevant. But I, I don't think you need to spend a whole lot of time on it. And I, and I don't think you need layers of approval on it. I think you just have to hit go and test and learn. And I think, you know, one of the things that was, that was great about Beekman is we don't have that bureaucracy here. And, and certainly we didn't want to spend a whole ton of money on content and creating content. So, you know, really leveraging our team to be able to produce that rapid clip of content, I think has been absolutely paramount to our success on TikTok. This is great, great advice. Thank you for, for sharing. You mentioned as well that the, in many ways you had prepared for COVID or at least COVID times without knowing this was coming for yeah. quite some time when it came to your go-to-market strategy from e-commerce to sort of the, the multi-channel strategy that you've been able to, to apply. You have such an interesting and diverse commerce mix and strategy i'd love to for you to sort of talk to this and and explain how you handle things from channel conflict to how the the last 18 months and the social commerce and e-commerce coming to the front how do you go from that piece of the business being a little bit more of a sideshow to being center stage and what has it changed in the business Sure. I, I think, you know, and this has been widely documented, so I'll try not to, to reiterate much of what's already out there, but 
COVID underscored the absolute need to be omnichannel. And I think that's most important when there is a crisis and people are choosing where they want to shop. Um, so for us, omnichannel is TV shopping, it's e-commerce, be, meaning beepin1802.com, and it's brick and mortar retail vis-a-vis -vis Ulta Beauty and our own store in upstate New York. And having the option to buy something on your mobile phone or in a store or on your TV or on your desktop, I think is absolutely critical in maintaining that brand experience throughout those channels, you know, is, is the only right way to do it. So, you know, when our store was shut down or, you know, when traffic was slow to come back to brick and mortar, TV shopping, you know, is where we lean into and then e-commerce throughout the, the COVID period, right? So having a multi-prong omni-channel strategy as far as distribution certainly was underscored by COVID. And I think a lot of people are thinking about that in a different way going forward. Got it. How have you, if at all, tied that, uh, that strategy, especially when it comes to e-commerce, uh, social commerce, to some of your digital marketing strategy. So your successes on TikTok, the work you've been doing with influencers, like where, where do these things collide or uh, are getting combined? Yeah, it, you know, it's a, it's a really hard question to answer because I think and our view is that media today, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or, or anything else is becoming so hyper fragmented and within the fragments that are occurring even within tiktok there are so many niche audiences and segments to go after our view is that marketing dollars are most effective and content is most effective when you have a combination of high creativity and a high niche perspective so the more niche you can get and the more creative you can get to target that niche is where we've seen the highest and, and most return on our marketing dollars and our time, quite frankly. So I don't think there is a one size fits all approach anymore. I think, you know, if you're posting the same thing on YouTube as TikTok, as Facebook, as Instagram, I, I don't think you're going to get very far today because the, the formats are so different. The way the reasons people are on those formats are so varied and then therefore, you know, the way to engage people and be relevant on those various platforms, you know, call for a very bespoke uh, approach. And so that's the approach we take. We have a completely different, you know, style of content and purpose across our channel, you know, mix, whether, you know, again, it's across those social channels. And, and I think ultimately, you know, that's, that's how we view it. As far as where does it show up, you know, between distribution and social, we see it really all over. You know, we see equal parts, you know, Ulta, equal parts, uh, our e-commerce. And I think, you know, for us, we're channel agnostic as far as where the, where the neighbor wants to shop for Beekman 1802. We just want to provide them the options to do it wherever they're most comfortable and convenient for them. Got it. So on the vantage point that the tracker is, because we, we have front row seats into all of these changes, industry changes, we're, we're seeing a lot of influencer partnerships uh, with brands, with platforms at times, becoming a lot more center stage when it comes to conversion and e-commerce. And influencer marketing used to live much further up the marketing funnel, so to speak, around awareness and advocacy. And now we're seeing a lot more influencer work down to, as an example, Amazon creating their own influencer stores on their platform. How, what's your thinking or philosophy around influencers getting involved in sales? Is it something that is exciting? Is it something that you're, you're involved in? Is it something that scares you? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the pendulum is definitely shifted. Um, and I think you're right as far as, you know, influencers, especially VIP influencers, you know, not necessarily driving conversion, but really an awareness play. You know, we've seen quite the opposite more recently. Our VIP influencers have driven very substantial conversion and we see it 
the minute they post, you know, the, the sales in our e-commerce and our uh, Ulta Beauty spike immediately. So they are driving conversion, but I think what, what is driving conversion today is a highly authentic, specific, and segmented message. I think those broad-based influencer campaigns, you know, I was always very skeptical about them. I think at, at some point they probably did work. I, I don't know, you know, it's not something we, we necessarily dabbled in, but we choose very specific influencers to work with. Actually, I say they choose us. And that has shown, uh, you know, direct ability to convert. Yeah, getting back to, uh, to authenticity and sort of brand, brand values that also match the, the influencers uh, sort of personal brand values as well. So I think that that gets to the, to the core of it. As we, as we share, the last year or two have, have really been instrumental in accelerating a lot of changes in the industry. And I, I still feel that we're in the midst of it. But if you were to use your crystal ball, that I know is how you probably run the business, right? Fast forward 10 years, how, how do you see all of these changes in materializing? How, how do we buy beauty products 10 years from now? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's much of what we've always believed, which is that the evolution of distribution of content and social platforms is only going to continue. I think, you know, a lot of people say, and I, and I would agree with this, is that China is 10 years ahead of the US in terms of, you know, how people buy beauty products. So let's take a couple things that, that you know, we've been observing in that market and how Beat Notes, you know, too fits into that context. The first is live streaming, which is, you know, is a fancy word for educating people on product through video or video commerce. And I think, you know, Beekman 1802, we've learned a lot. We say we've been live streaming, you know, for the last 10 years, but we intimately understand how to communicate the features and benefits and the brand message through video. And I think that's only going to continue to be underscored in the future as video becomes more accessible through our technology you know, there used to be a time where when you would take a video on your phone, it would it would eat up all of your, your hard drive space. And so that's clearly not the case anymore. And video streaming is is becoming, you know, more and more expected and and, and the consumer is getting comfortable with buying things through video, um, you know, through social platforms. So I think that's that's definitely part of the future. When is it going to happen? When is it going to happen at scale? I mean, I, I think, you know, your guess is probably as good as mine. I think the other thing, you know, that we have always been a proponent for and has never changed in our perspective is ownership of the first party data. You know, for us, uh, email has really been key and and communicating with, with people through a digital means. Email has not changed really that much in the last 20 years. And at the same time, it's become more and more important because of all of the privacy concerns that are out there in the world. So if you don't have ownership of first party data and have a strategy around that, I think it's going to be really challenging to catch up as things become more opaque, you know, with whether it be, you know, privacy changes or or social reporting or attribution modeling. And then the, the third thing I would say, you know, from our perspective, besides first party data is the one-on-one physical connection with a customer. I always say that, you know, to our data team, who is, who's fantastic and to our digital team, it's not a number, it's a person, right? And whether it's text message, you know, where we have a pretty robust uh, SMS and MMS platform, there's a person behind that phone number. There's a person behind the email. There's a person behind the order. And when you come into our store or you call up our customer service line, we're going to respect that you are a person. You're going to get welcomed with a high neighbor. Uh, You're not going to get an answering machine. You're not going to get an automated response. You're going to get a real person. And I think that human connection cannot get lost as digital becomes, you know, 50, 60, 70% of our business and and our strategies and our marketing dollars, we can't lose sight that there are real people at the end of the day that are using and buying our products 
And so, you know, those are, are my three things. And, and, I, and I don't think they're much different than anything else we've done over the last, you know, five, 10 years. Interesting. I, I love these. And uh, if I go back to the first one that you mentioned, it, it's quite interesting to also look at your positioning because you, you've, you've gotten really strong on the social side. You have a history with Home Shopping Network and sort of uh, like the, this, uh, this other side uh, of, uh, of commercialization. And what, what you seem to be indicating is that there's a bit of a conversion of these behaviors where some old tactics that had been using that we've we've been using for a while, now we have new means, new tools to do it easier, faster on mobile phones, et cetera, and maybe with different players as well. So it's 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 interesting to to think of it this way. I, I also love the 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 notion of humanization of marketing. I think this is a, a big trend that we're that we're seeing. I could not agree more. Let me throw my, my prediction to this and have you react to it and see see how that sure. uh, resonates sure. or doesn't. I feel very strongly that in the next, we'll call it 10 years, but let's remember that the, a year ago, we had sort of like 10 years of changes happening in, in 12 months. Right. So to your point, timing is flexible. But I, I strongly feel that over the next 10 years, there's a chasm that will take place in the beauty industry and across industries at large between brands with very strong brand values mm. and everybody else who is going to get the white label and commoditized. And you're going to have not one industry, but two industries, one with very high margins, high retention rates, a, a lot of brand loyalty, and another one that will just compete on, on p- pennies on a dollar for margin. And in some cases, probably also working off uh, third-party brands like uh, influencer personal brands. And so it, to, to me, the, the brands that are at risk are this uh, the happy middle today that don't really have that very strong sense of brand values, brand purpose you're just expressing about Beekman. And on the other side, they, they do not know how to function on low margins because the beauty industry historically is a very high margin industry. What are your thoughts on this? Am I, how right or wrong am I in your, in your crystal ball? I would say it's, it's already happening. You know, you, you do have inklings of that in, in the industry, whether it be the ordinary with their single ingredient focus and selling, you know, $6 vials of, of salicylic acid and retinol and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, that brand has exploded and done a tremendous job. And then I say, I, I think on the flip side is you're right, you know, brands that have had value, historically have had strong values and a moral compass and purpose, you know, since the dawn of time have uh, been better off. And I think the reason of maybe where you were going with that is it, it becomes even more important when you have media so fragmented and you have the evolution and pace of change within media evolving so rapidly. And I think if you don't know who you are, it is quite difficult and and you have to find meaning behind your, your company, your culture internally, you know, your types of consumers that you're trying to approach. I think for Beekman, one of the things that that is really important to the team and, and, the, and the founders and, and really is culturally instituted here is our message of kindness. And so we try to figure out how can we implement kindness in everything we do, whether it's you know, the rubric that we find influencers against, the um, you know, onboarding process and indoctrination of culture within our team and employees. And I think that when you take that approach, it doesn't have to be about the message or the founders or the product anymore, because everything you do is is centered around one singular focus. And so it becomes really easy when content evolves and social platforms change and, you know, retailers emerge to find where you're going to be a fit. And so, you know, for us, do we expect things to change? Absolutely. Uh, in, in the market and, and with media and distribution? Yeah, absolutely. But I think, you know, ultimately, the core piece of Beekman will never change. And, and that's, uh, that's what I think is super important. Got it. 
Uh, Tomei, thanks much for all of these insights and amazing views on the market, on the brand. Are you partnering with your influencers to help drive sales this holiday season? With Tracker's new social commerce capabilities, you can select the best influencers to help increase traffic to your e-commerce site, create tracking links and streamline commission payments to influencers, and measure the impact of every campaign and influencer on your KPIs. From awareness to conversion, Tracker provides the intelligence and tools you need to impact each stage of your customer journey. Reach out at tracker.com to learn more. As we conclude this podcast, there, there are three questions that I like to ask all of our guests and I'd love for you to contribute. Uh, starting with, who do you look up to for marketing inspiration, whether it's a brand or a person? Oh, gosh, that, that's a great question. You know, I think we are inspired by brands that do have great values uh, and are great at communicating those values. So, you know, we often talk about like Patagonia, right, or Nike. These are people that seem to have a very direct impact in their customers' lives. And I think we we see ourselves very similar. So I think Patagonia is, is someone that we, we look up to quite, quite a bit. Awesome. Second question. What's the one source of news that you keep going back to for marketing information? And please do not say the fast track because nobody will see me <laughs> blush over the podcast. Oh, gosh. I, I think that, you know, the, the two things that I spend a lot of my time on, I don't know if you consider this news or not, but the, the two things that I, I spend a lot of time on is what are our customers saying and where I try to get that data from and where we try to, to organize that data from is our field team. So we have a team of, of people that go into Ulta stores and talk to customers directly about the benefits of Beekman 1802, our kindness philosophy. So I try to understand what are people responding to and what are people not responding to and how we can activate the brand in store. I read our net promoter score survey every single morning. We probably have, you know, to date 25,000 respondents and our NPS score is a 90. And I think it's this obsession about how the customer would be likely to recommend Beekman to a friend is so important to me. And so I, I try to figure out, you know, what is affecting the NPS score on, a, on an anecdotal and qualitative basis and what are the trends that, I, that I'm noticing and how can we either lean into that more or, you know, remedy issues. And, you know, I think the other piece is certainly our, our voice of the, the neighbor, which is, you know, a view, a weekly view on our customer service respondents. Those, I think, it, you know, and, and this is clearly how internally and isolated I am into Beekman 1802 and probably our entire team, because we don't pay a lot of attention to the outside world. We're, we're pretty keen on, on figuring out how can we impact the lives and make the world a better place for our neighborhood. And, um, and those are probably the three ways that, that I spend most of my time, you know, when I think about news. I think right, right there is probably your secret sauce to success is to be community and customer obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I really can, you know, I, of course I read the news, but I think it's more of a, a hobby yeah. rather than, than, you know, what we try to do. at least. Awesome. And last question, what, what is the next trend or platform that you're investing time in? Well, we're, you know, as you know, we, we spend a lot of time on TikTok. I think TikTok, you know, and I loved your perspective of it when we talked the other day, but I think TikTok is in the very early innings of, of their success story. And it's, it's certainly grown rapidly, maybe more rapid than, than any other platform. Would you agree with that? It's, it's great. Absolutely. So, the, the numbers don't lie. It right. Has. So I think TikTok is, is very early in their trajectory, and I have been a big proponent about video and video as, you know, 99.9% .9 of social going forward. I, I think that to me is, is where we're spending a lot of our attention. One of the unique things about TikTok, and I'll try not to rant here, is 
that the change of pace within TikTok about you know the relevance of certain influencers, the relevance of content, is at a pace that I think you know we've never seen across social. And so, being relevant and engaging and entertaining on TikTok is a real challenge. But I think that's what makes the platform so immersive, and and how you can spend you know thirty minutes of your time in a flash on TikTok. So I think you know that that's where we're doubling down quite a bit in in terms of new platforms, if you will. Awesome. Well, Tomé, thanks again for spending the time with us. It's been enlightening. Very much appreciate your insights, and you're welcome anytime back on the fast track. Sure. Thank you much. Not, absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hey, right. take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of the fast track. Tell us what you thought of this episode by emailing us at ft.tracker.com. That is ft.traaskr.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with a friend and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening from today. Thanks again, and see you next time.